Hi, I'm Kate Mackay, Associate Film Curator here at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. We have been missing seeing you in our Barbara Osher Theater, but I'm delighted to welcome you to a special online conversation about Son of Monarchs, Alexis Gambus's wonderfully layered and intricate new film that looks as, at issues of migration, climate change, and identity through the lens of science, particularly the study of monarch butterflies using UC Berkeley developed CRISPR technology. If you haven't already seen it, I encourage you to check it out along with our other Watch From Home offerings at bampfa.org. Alexis Gambus, the director of Son of Monarchs, is a French Venezuelan filmmaker, molecular biologist, and assistant professor in the departments of the sciences and humanities at New York University Abu Dhabi. His feature films include The Color of Time from 2012, The Fly Room from 2014, and Mosaic from 2017. He is a 2019 TED Fellow, and he is the founder and artistic director of the Imagine Film Festival, dedicated to exploring the intersection of art and science. And in this conversation, Alexis is speaking with Aaron Pomerantz, a doctoral student in the integrative biology at UC Berkeley, who's interested in how butterflies are able to produce such an incredible array of colors through the use of pigments and structural coloration. He spent two years as a field biologist at the Tambopata Research Center, a remote research out, outpost in the Peruvian Amazon, and has received grant funding from Na the National Geographic Society to apply novel technology to field work, such as origami-based microscopes and handheld gene sequencers. And our conversation today will be moderated by Andreas Sediel, a documentary filmmaker and professor of visual journalism here at, UC, the, here at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. He was the producer of Rape in the Fields and was a writer and producer of Rape on the Night Shift, which combined to win a DuPont Columbia Journalism Award the RFK Grand Prize for Journalism, and were nominated for four national um, Emmys. He was a writer and producer of Trafficked in America and co-produced The Judge and the General, a DuPont Columbia Journalism winner and Emmy-nominated film, which chronicled the human rights cases against the former Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet. A big thank you to our digital content manager, Dave Taylor, for his help with this recording. And thank you to our guests for, for being here. And thank you to the audience for taking the time to watch this conversation. And now I'll turn it over to Andres. So uh, Alexis and Aaron, it's great to have you guys here to, uh, to talk about this film, which is, you know, wonderful merging of, you know, science and art and spirituality. Uh, love to talk about some of these issues of migration and climate change. There's, there's a lot going on in this film, uh, even playing with, you know, what is factual and what is fiction. Uh, and as I was looking at this film, one of the things, you know, just from the starting point of the, the opening scene is, is the viewer is taken into this moment of uh, dissecting, it looks like a, a, a pupa, it's, it's not clear what it is or, or what's going on. And it's, it's, it's a view that most of us who haven't been spending time in a lab looking through a microscope have ever seen before. Um, Aaron, I was hoping if, if you could tell us from your perspective, what's going on in that scene. And then Alexis, if you could follow up with how you took that moment and turned it into a filmmaking moment. So, so Aaron, what was happening in there? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I thought it was a really cool perspective of looking, peering into the microscope mm -hmm. and sort of seeing the perspective through, you know, maybe a scientist's eyes as he's trying to figure out what is going on inside of a chrysalis. And I think a chrysalis is, you know, despite, despite all of our advancements in science, it's still kind of a black box inside of there, this little insect that turns into this beautiful organism. And that transformation process from caterpillar to chrysalis to an adult with beautiful, colorful butterfly wings um, is still kind of a mystery. So I really like that perspective and sort of seeing someone start to pick into it and then sort of revealing that there's a wing inside. I thought that was a, 
that was an interesting window into into the process of wing development. And is that does that look like what your work is? I mean, is that basically what you're doing? Yeah, it is. It is a lot. You know, as a developmental biologist, you're trying to figure out how things get built, and in this case, how does a butterfly build its wings? Um, you know, it's uh, some process that occurs without any extra help, um, any guidance from external forces, it's all inside that chrysalis. And so that's why as a scientist, you have to raise them and you have to peer inside in one way or another. And, and in some cases you do these kind of little micro surgeries in order to lift the hood and see what's going on inside. You, you, you reference this, this mystery. I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, whether it's, uh, it's fable or it's storytelling or it's magic of, you know, if, if from even being a little kid, you think, okay, there's the, the caterpillar and then it goes into its little bag and out comes a butterfly. And, and it doesn't sound like we even know how that happens yet, but there's certainly a lot of lit literary and cinematic uh, opportunities there. Alexis, what drew you to using that image in that moment to, to, to start off the film? Well, first of all, yeah, it's exciting to be here and, uh, and talk to you both. Yeah, I, I think the, the idea of that sequence was to show, you know, in real time, you know, kind of what it means to, to work in a lab and, and kind of the, the poetry, but also kind of the visceral experience of, you know, of dissecting through a chrysalis. And I think, um, I think that it was an interesting way to start the film because we're basically in a situation where we're trying to understand the character. And I, I thought it would be an interesting way to begin by, you know, by literally dissecting through a chrysalis and, and making that connection between, you know, between a character that we don't know yet um, and, you know, and the connection with, with this chrysalis. And, um, and I, I like that sequence because it's a, it's a long sequence and it's very meticulous and, it shows what you know what's involved in kind of going through those layers and as Aaron says you know in this little chrysalis everything is there you know all of the genetic information to um to make the wing and um and so you know I as I was thinking about how I would open the film I thought that it would be interesting that as he as he starts peeling those layers off he would start hearing his past you know and there would be kind of resonance with his grandmother and and so this all kind of you know came together and I thought okay let me start the film and actually it was a much longer sequence I had a I had the whole sequence where you keep they put the pin into the chrysalis and then I remember my editor saying like no we have to we have to cut this down it's it's way too long mm -hmm. um but um but yeah and, and I think it sets the stage for you know what the film is going to be about and um and, you know, it's also very, very raw and very kind of um, graphic as well. And I thought, I thought that was interesting because we always think, as you were mentioning, Andres, the, the beauty of the caterpillar and the metamorphosis, but here there's something very kind of, um, you know, very kind of gore as well in terms mm -hmm. of kind of going into that, into that uh, butterfly pupa. And I think one other thing that it did uh, for the viewer is often these labs are thought of as being very clinical, very sterile. And then as you were, the word to use, very visceral, there's like, there's life happening there. I guess it's, you know, kind of the, the muck of biology. Um, but then both your work, Aaron, and the film start to explore uh, the, the use of color and how the butterfly uh, uses color or doesn't use color or adapts color. Um, I want to play again with the, the, the science and art of this a little bit and throw this back to you, uh, Aaron, to talk a little bit about the role of color in the butterfly wing and then Alexis, how you use that very thematically in the film. So, so Aaron, can you tell us a little bit about the, the butterfly's use of color? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, color is something that is just surrounding us and, you know, it's, it's just part of our everyday lives and it's used primarily as a form to communicate. There's, you know, uh, animals that will communicate mostly by sound, maybe like bats at night, um, moths that will communicate and, and ants that will communicate with smell through chemicals and pheromones. But the way that butterflies communicate primarily is through their colorful wings, their advertisements. You know, they're telling a predator that they're distasteful through their bright and flashy orange colors. Um, or they're telling a, a mate where to find them with their, you know, bright and flashy blue colors. 
So it, it is a means of communicating that is just fundamental to their existence and their evolution. Um, and they're communicating with each other and with, with other organisms all around them. So I think that's why their, their wings have been such an area of interest to humans because they're just, they're just dazzling the way that they communicate through this signal. And it's, my understanding is, is that the genetic research is, is, talks a little bit about how you can turn off the colors or not, and that there's even butterflies that have invisible wings. Uh, I mean, uh, what, what, are, what are we learning about that? What's, what's known now? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. You know, what, what are we trying to learn about these organisms? And I think, you know, nowadays we can try and get to the fundamental code of life, mm. which is looking at its DNA and asking the question, how do these, how does this string of DNA code something like this? How do you have, you know, a combination of just A's, T's, G's, and C's that produce a beautiful bright orange wing um, and pattern it? And so that's, that's where we're at now, where we can ask those, those kind of questions down to the like code of life. Um, and I think that's what's something that's really fascinating that's showcased in the film that Alexis showed through some of the researchers is that, you know, we have this power now to, to read life. You can read the DNA sequence. And now we have the power to rewrite it um, through mm -hmm. tools like CRISPR-Cas9, where you can say, we think that this gene is involved in something, but we don't know what it is. Let's turn it off. And then you can see the effect of a single gene that's flipped off and see that in the context of butterflies, it's like a light switch. It will transform it from bright orange to brown or from you know, a goldish color to a blue. And so we can you know, really play around with this code now. Uh, and it's, it's you know, remarkable and, and in some cases pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's moments in the film where, you, where some of this tension is, is brought out in terms of are, are we going too far with uh, playing around with genes. Alexis, you, you've spent time in the labs. You've, you've, you've wrestled with these questions. Uh, how did you uh, start to think about this in a storytelling way? And, and why, why do this in a film uh, with your character Mendel, who himself uh, is like a butterfly and, in fact, in a uh, symbolic way, tries to become a butterfly himself. Yeah. Well, right. So, I mean, I, I spent most, so I'm, I refer to myself as a, like a retired scientist. I, um, I spent most of my twenties working on fruit flies. So not butterflies, but, um, but I spent a lot of time, you know, observing fruit flies and I, and I always find that it's interesting to, you know, I started becoming interested in film through microscopy and through, my work um, in the laboratory, but in this case, what I find interesting when I when I make films is to connect the scientific research to both a personal quest, but also to these broader, you know, broader kind of societal and political um, and cultural issues. And I thought that the whole concept of color that Aaron is talking about, and this idea that color is written in a genetic code, and now with the you know with the advent of CRISPR technology and other genetic technology, now we're able to really precisely turn an on and off genes. And, you know, and as Aaron was mentioning, it's, you know, the absence of a gene that may be responsible for a specific color, you know, may actually create a whole different color, or it also may affect the way colors are being separated. You know, this idea of borders between, between colors, mm -hmm. um, this idea of having fuzzy borders versus clean borders. And, and so I was really fascinated by not only the idea of color, but separation of color. And then of course, immediately what came to my mind is, well, the monarch is an interesting symbol for immigration and also for speaking about, you know, to some extent, you know, by speaking about color, we're also speaking about race, you know, and why do we have the color that we have? You know, why do certain colors make us, you know, have specific traits or behaviors? And so for me, it was an interesting parallel between a story about, you know, an immigrant story about a scientist in New York and um, that directly feeds into um, also the concept of color. And so, um, and I play a little bit with this, you know, it's, you know, a Mexican scientist who identifies with a monarch butterfly, you know, and, and the research kind of becomes like a symbol of his own, of his own life. And so, so I wanted to explore that and I wanted him to also explain it to others, you know, explain what he works on and, and this whole idea of color. And, and it's, it's a way for him to also express himself, you know, as, as an individual. Um, and I find it really interesting in, in film to not necessarily 
break down the science, but just kind of present the science almost as poetry, you know, and and have people talk about the science and you know in very technical ways, but see how they get excited with it, and also not necessarily talk about it in in English, but also have them potentially also speak in Spanish and other languages. And so that's sort of how this all came together um, and and connecting these the research to um, to the personal, but also to the to these bigger questions. Yeah. You mentioned that in some ways it's semi uh, autobiographical um, and then the issues of, of migration. I'm curious of why you thought that, uh, why you felt like this story needed to be told now. Uh, why was, why, what was the relevance to the moment we're, we're living in, whether it's political or environmental? Ah, oh, there's so many reasons. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. I mean, um, well, definitely it's, partly, uh, you know, autobiographical in the sense that it, it is a little bit my journey when I was in my 20s and trying to understand where I belonged and spending so much time in a laboratory in a dark room, you know, with confocal microscopes and, and kind of having this, these moments of soul searching as I was trying to understand the, you know, the identity of another animal. Um, but I think it's, it's an important film. Of course, I'm biased because I, I made it, but I think it's a film that also speaks about a different type of immigration, um, about having, you know, immigrant scientists, in this case, you know, you know, Latino scientists that, you know, are portrayed in a different way than we're maybe used to in film. Um, and also this idea that migration is, is happening in both ways. You know, it's this story of somebody that goes back to Mexico. It's not about somebody that's crossing the border that we often see in films, but somebody that, you know, identifies with the monarch butterfly because the monarch butterfly has an ability of migrating back and forth between, uh, between places. And of course, migration is something that is part of, part of their fitness. You know, they migrate because they need to migrate and, um, and, and for survival. And, um, and I also thought it was important to shed light on the research that Aaron and, and others are doing in terms of CRISPR and, and not always thinking about CRISPR in terms of, you know, in terms of disease or fighting, you know, you know, these bigger questions, but, but on the level of uh, basic research and on the level of, you know, um, evolutionary biology of understanding life and patterns, um, because we don't often think about CRISPR in the context of understanding the building blocks of life. We always put CRISPR, when it's put into the media, we put it into this you know, it's politicized and we're, we're speaking about CRISPR in, in other ways. And I thought it was important to be like, well, you know, as mentioned in the panel discussion in the film, mm -hmm. there's that, but also CRISPR is important for us to really um, parse through, you know, the building blocks of life. And, um, and so that's, you know, I, I was really inspired by actually, I, a lot of the times when I make films, I'm inspired by, by images, you know, and, um, and so that's kind of how I stumbled across I believe it was one of Aaron's initial time lapses. And then that brought me to the whole community that works on this, you know, from, you know, Nepal Patel to Bob Reed to Arnaud Martin, all of these people that work in this field of, of color and patterning and, and butterflies, yeah. So Aaron, when, when you're watching this, how much of it were you identifying with the characters? And then I'm also, curious what you might have learned about your own work seeing it through the lens of the film. Yeah, it's it's really cool to hear that, Alexis, about, you know, seeing some of the imagery and, and being inspired to, you know, get together with the community and, and see what they're up to. It, it is a really cool community, you know, like you mentioned, Bob Reed and Arnaud and people who are, you know, really just these curious people who are trying to better understand life. And, you know, these tools, like you mentioned, you've mentioned some of the microscopy and CRISPR and, you know, these are all just tools, but the goal is, is, is driven by just curiosity to better understand, you know, through the lens of an organism, how did it get that way? Why does it look that way? Why does it behave that way? Um, so they're all just tools by which, you know, scientists are trying to satisfy their innate curiosity of trying to understand the natural world. And that's, you know, that's what, that's what's driven me. I, I grew up in Los Angeles and my mom created a little ecosystem and uh, you know it was all native California um, plants and so that of course attracted monarch butterflies and all sorts of insects and and birds and lizards so I was just you know that kid growing up in the dirt playing around with natives in California um, and I think that was really instrumental to 
my curiosity of just trying to understand the, the natural world. And so, you know, when I came to Berkeley and Nippon Patel's lab, um, they were using tools like live imaging, you know, trying to watch development happen in a, in a relatively natural state, you know, sort of in contrast with how you opened the film, how we were talking about uh, where you have a, a pinned down pupa and a scalpel and scissors. And, you know, it's classically a very invasive process to understand biology, right? Um, you have to, it, it doesn't want that. Um, it's sort of closed off a closed system and a black box um, by its very nature. So you have to be a little bit invasive as a scientist. And that's why I think, you know, with, with some new ways of trying to just watch it happen through live imaging, meaning, you know, having it basically open um, in, the, in like a, a chrysalis, have the wing exposed, but just watch it naturally develop um, and be as, as non-invasive as possible. It, it's hard, um, you know, biology does, does well, it wants to keep its secrets by being closed off. So you have to peer in and do it as gently as possible. But it was really exciting to hear you say that, you know, you watched some of the videos because um, when I got into the lab, I was just blown away that there were these little techniques and tricks that we could use to peer inside of a pupa. Um, and so I had some background and experience working as a, a nature photographer and got the uh, you know chance to work with some videographers um, when I was working as a field biologist in Peru. Um, so it was the first time I sort of started to merge, you know, uh, filming techniques. And then when I started as a PhD student, I was able to kind of combine some of the science and videography to put those together and then just put it out into the world for other people to watch. So that's that's really cool to hear that, uh, you know, you were able to watch some of those videos and, and getting more involved with the community for this film. I, re I remember just, just to add to that, I remember when I went to visit Nippon Patel, who, who runs the lab at UC Berkeley, um, and I mentioned that I was a filmmaker and, and, and trying to you know, make a film about butterflies that, you know, Nepom said, oh, you have to meet Aaron because he's kind of like our filmmaker in residence, you know, here in, here in the lab. And he's developed these like techniques to really film, um, you know, as Aaron was mentioning, kind of in a non-invasive way. Um, also this idea that you create a window, you know, into the pupa, I find to be so fascinating. It's kind of like a, like almost like a peephole where you can actually observe um, you know, the, the, the development happening by kind of creating like a, you know, like a, like a window into, into the pupa. And I thought that was just such a, such a beautiful way of doing it. And then, you know, and then I started kind of binging on, on some of the videos, um, that, that were actually kind of viral, like everybody was watching them and, um, and using that as, as inspiration. And I should mention that the, the initial dissection of, of the film um, it's definitely not, it wasn't done by the actor, it was done by Bob Reed at Cornell. So mm. he came to the set and, and so we had a scientist that basically stood in with his hands and, you know, and he's the one who did the dissection for, um, for the opening scene, so. So there was a lot of the, the film's uh, impetus that came through the relationship between the two of you. And yeah, this is the first time that you're meeting. Um, <laughs> I'm curious uh, what what questions you have for each other, or what you've learned from each other's work throughout this process, or you know, with this, you know, in in science, obviously, there's always another question. Um, in the in the artistic process, there's always another iteration. So uh, I'll start with you, Aaron. I don't know when you were watching the piece if there was anything that you you learned about your work that you hadn't thought of, or or, or questions for, for Alexis that came up um, while you were watching. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was, a lot of it was very close to home. Um, you know, seeing characters like um, that, that looked, they re looked like they resembled Bob Reed and some of the, you know, sayings that they, um, that they made in the film. Uh, I, I've heard them give talks at scientific conferences using, you know, similar types of phrasing. So I thought it was really cool to see the, the inspiration of some of the characters directly from the scientists and, and not, you know, not flashing them up or making them, you know, more like, um, Maybe it, would, maybe it would be like a stereotype of a scientist. It really was, you know, I felt like uh, the essence of, of some of these, um, you know, scientists in the community. So I thought that was really cool. That was, that was really exciting to see. Um, the techniques were, like Alexis mentioned, they were the techniques. They weren't sort of made up techniques and the equipment wasn't flashy or, or changed at all either. They were the lab settings, they were the microscopes and it was really a, a natural environment that wasn't, um, it wasn't, spruced up in any way that was unnatural to the science. So 
that was really cool to see and sort of you know your grungy lab environment it's not like pristine you know white lab coats everywhere it's people walking around with coffee and being a normal you know having having day-to-day lives and struggles and activities and then they're going and sitting at the bench you know and just carrying on with with work and plugging away and that there really is a, a window into the the graduate life and the struggle and having friends moving all of these things were really I thought captured that essence really nicely so I, I really enjoyed seeing that. Alexis I don't know if there was anything that you know no well, yeah I think um you know for for me when when I when I started making the film and you know what Aaron was mentioning I I really wanted to have scientists involved in all aspects you know and, and not only being featured in the film but also in the production design as, as Aaron was mentioning kind of the the space you know where, where we work the they, they have this amazing syringe which is used for like injection of you know of CRISPR and so I had all of these things I was very obsessed with with really capturing that, no, you know, no lab coats because I, I, ne I never really wore a lab coat also when I was doing my fruit fly research. And, um, and I thought, you know, I think one of the things that was interesting to me is, is always when, when I'm working with scientists, you know, I'm, I am a scientist myself, but I, you know, I'm a little rusty because I haven't been in the lab for so long, but is to challenge them to, to be in, 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 um, in works that are works of fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that to be really fascinating when, you know, when I ask Bob Reed to, you know, to be in the film or to help us with some dissections, um, or I had other people kind of be involved. I always find it interesting to see like how far would, would they go, you know, or, or are they willing to go into this realm of fiction? Mm -hmm. And so many of the things that happen in the film is kind of me challenging, you know, and then with Aaron and, and Ryan, also that was that was involved in some of this imagery I, I was curious to see whether or not they would be interested in you know they would be okay with me using imagery and kind of lifting it out of its context and putting it into a film you know not necessarily knowing where and how I was going to actually insert it and so um, so that's something that I find interesting in my work but also with scientists is kind of this this merge of like you know we want to be factual but there's also kind of this 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 element of like a fascination of taking something and putting it into another context. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of the tattoo, not to give too much away, and I know Bob is gonna kill me for years <laughs> ago. I remember Bob, I was speaking with Bob at Cornell and, and I asked him like, what is, what, what's one of the craziest things you've thought about? He's like, oh, I've thought about like tattooing myself with, uh, with butterfly, with like Omochrome or something. Or I don't know how <laughs> that mentioned, but then I was like, oh, what, you know, it would be interesting to kind of flirt with science fiction, even though that's obviously entering into a different realm is, you know, we're in this like very realistic scientific lab, but playing with magical realism and playing with, you know, realizing the dreams of scientists, you know, what if we could become a monarch? What if we could put like Omochrome into, into our skin? And so, um, so that, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm really fascinated with. And I'm also, I love having, you know, for example, Hitchcock, um, you know, there, there's been these collaborations between like Hitchcock and Bunuel or Bunuel and, um, and Salvador Dali where you have like artists involved in the making of a film, you know, you ask them to like shoot a dream sequence, for example, mm -hmm. right? And I find that interesting with scientists is having them like basically give them a moment in the film where it's their moment, it's their sequence. And mm -hmm. so I did that with, with Aaron and, you know, we, we could play that small clip. I know we, we have, we've been pretty bad at showing videos up till now. <laughs> um, but one of the videos that Aaron gave me that I sort of color corrected um, as well. I don't know if we have that handy, but. Um, yeah, let's, or, uh, let's just take a look at the clip. It's very short, <laughs> um, but but one of the things that I did and and um, is you know so that was the discussion I was having with Aaron and Ryan. But it's kind of incorporating these soundscapes, you know, that um, you know that are connected to the film. They're connected to the rituals and 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 things that are happening in the film. But um, 
but yeah, I don't know how Aaron feels about that, about kind of taking that imagery and, and creating kind of a story around it. Um, that's always something that I'm, I'm curious to, you know, to hear what Aaron thinks about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I mean, I, I loved it. I thought it was a really cool, uh, um, you know, it, it felt kind of like this, uh, an interesting transition moment, the way you used it. Um, and because it is a time sequence, right? And, and like you said, it's it maybe 14 sequ seconds, uh, but that was eight days condensed into 14 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, you know, and, and that's kind of an interesting perspective, you know, if it's your first time seeing that kind of clip, uh, what you're seeing is uh, a pupa of a painted lady butterfly, um, but its wings are kind of opened up. Um, and so what you're watching is the forewing and the hindwing, and that's kind of why it looks like it's sort of, um, you know, spread open in that way. Um, and so, but you, you know, you watch the color slip on at the end, that's probably the most notable process that your eye catches. Um, but in the span of those eight days of development, everything is happening. The entire wing is developing. Um, early on, its uh, cells are growing, they're differentiating, the scales are forming. They're, they're not formed in the beginning. Um, so the scales have to grow, they have to take shape, they expand. Um, and then it's just at the very end, you know, about 12 hours before it emerges as an adult butterfly, that those genes that make those pigments sort of flip on. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why you get this sort of, you know, flash of color at the end. Um, but yeah, it's sort of a, 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 I thought it was a cool use of the sequence, um, you know, especially just because you see, you know, sort of this, this uh, growth and expansion of color um, for kind of this transition. So I, I, I really enjoyed um, the use of it. it. It was really cool to see. So uh, just wanted to share a little more context on that too, just because, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting to, to try and film those pupae as they developed, you know, we have um, sort of an, a, a camera set up with a high magnification lens um, and a timer taking a picture every 20 minutes for the span of eight days. Um, mm -hmm. So that was sort of that process condensed down. Mm -hmm. you know, you were... that, that, um, that phase of, of butterfly pigmentation, um, that specific moment where, you know, the, the genes, you know, start expressing the color was something that I, I couldn't actually get. I, of all the filming that I had done in the dissections, and so that's where I turned to Aaron and I said, well, you know, we'd love to use some of your imagery um, for that. And, um, and you know, what, what's also fascinating is that we don't necessarily have the context, right, about the painted lady and all these things, but, but it's more about just kind of the, the moment in the film where the, what the character is going through. And I, I also love that, taking imagery out of context and having people just experience it in kind of this very primal way. Um, and then if they want to learn more, then they, they would learn a little bit more about what, what these images mean and, and how they were taken, but, um, but yeah. It's exciting that, you know, this research is being done at UC Berkeley, it, you know, it gives us a window into this. And one of the things that's interesting, you know, hearing both of you talk about, you know, it's almost this, this magic moment, you know, the, this metamorphosis, you know, one of these, you know, biological moments that is kind of defies logic, but you guys are studying it. And I'm wondering, uh, Alexis, you, you talk about mixing the fact and the fiction in if this subject almost necessitates that you start to move into this fiction because we're really reaching the limit of what science knows. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that there's, you know, definitely, um, as you said, the limitations of what we know is, is a good stepping ground for fiction, you know? And that those two worlds don't don't contradict each other. You know, it's um, fiction is a way of you know filling in the gaps as well. You know that, um, and I think that there are moments. I mean, I've experienced that when I was at the microscope. There are moments where we kind of dream on, or the fact that we spend so much time looking at these things, we we start kind of having dreamscapes. Uh, I don't know mm -hmm. if Aaron, had that, <laughs> I'm sure when you when you're taking those images every 20 minutes, you know, and and that kind of. Um, you know, work, it, it, it's kind of an interesting, almost like a trance experience, you know? Um, and, um, and so I thought it was, yeah, definitely a lot of, a lot of the other scenes in the film, the rituals and, and the, the dreamscapes, a lot of those were in a way informed by what I had seen and, and some of Aaron's imagery, thinking about the water, for example. Um, and, you know, all of those things came from some of these butterfly imageries where I kind of Mm -hmm. I had those as a reference for the for the production design or for the aesthetic, and then I said, okay, we're going to put this car this actor in a, in a swimming pool with pigments, and we're just mm -hmm. going to have him float there as if he was, you know, like a developing pupa. And so, um, 
so I thought, you know, that, that was, that was definitely my, my idea was to use, um, use the science as kind of a, a portal into the, into the fiction, into the magical realism. And yeah, definitely when you're working with butterflies, there's so much, you know, mysticism around it that I thought, you know, why not kind of go there, but go there from like a scientific angle, you know, as a scientist experiencing that versus, versus any other way. So, um, mm -hmm. but, but as I was doing the, the research on the film, I, I did a lot of documentary work. I interviewed, um, I didn't actually get a chance to interview Aaron, but um, you know, some, some butterfly scientists and, and I went to Mexico and all of those stories combined helped me kind of create this merge between, between fact and, and fiction. Aaron, have you ever dreamt of butterflies? Yes. Uh, and, you know, you, you stare, I think you, if you stare at anything long enough under a microscope, you know, when you lay down at night, that he, your brain will start to replay and, and conjure things up. And like you said, Alexis, you spend enough time staring at the confocal microscope and you will, your mind will, you know, in, input things to try and fill in the, the gaps that your experiment hasn't yet. Um, but I like what you said too about, um, you know, playing off of like the mysticism and, and the fact that we can't explain certain things. And, you know, I think that's still the case with, um, you know, the monarch and its migration. You know, a lot, a lot of people have studied these butterflies for a long, long time. They're charismatic. They're like, you know, the poster child um, for butterflies and for migration. And yet there's still a lot we don't know about how they do this, you know? And I, I remember, um, you know, watching one of the clips where you were interviewing Nepom about this and he was mentioning too, like, this is a, not a single trip that an individual makes for a migration, mm -hmm. but multiple generations. So it is encoded in their DNA. And, you know, yeah, we've tried to figure out, are they using magnetic fields? Are they using, you know, seasons and temperature and sunlight? But we still don't really know how they do it. And yet it's encoded in them and, and they are compelled to find their home and they, and they still do an amazing job doing it. So I felt like, you know, maybe you were touching on that too with the character um, mm -hmm. and, you know, his, his, these external forces compelling him to keep, you know, making his way back home as well. Mm, yeah. I think, you know, with all the spirituality and unknowns, there's also a lot of things that are being touched on in this piece that are very real and concrete, uh, whether they have to do with borders or race or place. Uh, they're really integral to how the story is told and, and what we're understanding about that. Um, I'm curious, Alexis, about the, you know, you, you alluded to this a little bit, but the use of the monarch specifically uh, to talk about these issues of migrations and how we're compelled or impeded and what the future of these migrations might be. Yeah, so as, as Aaron was mentioning, there, there's so much we don't know, but at the same time, what's fascinating about the butterfly is that it, it's become such a strong symbol for, for you know, for the ability to kind of move and, and migrate. Um, and I thought that was really fascinating is that I, at, on one hand, scientists are kind of, you know, trying to wrap their heads around, you know, how this migration occurs and what are the, you know, what are the factors, you know, you know circadian rhythms, temperature, you know, pheromones, all, all of these questions. But then on another level, there's, um, you know, there's the, the kind of the symbol of the monarch as, a symbol for, you know, people that are undocumented or the, you know, the ability to be able to migrate back and forth, you know, in this case, because we're talking about the North American migration, you know, the, the migration into Mexico and, and, and back. Um, I thought it was interesting that the monarch became a symbol for migrant rights, you know. Um, and I started seeing that in many, speaking to activists and, and people that um, we're using the monarch in, in kind of like a symbol to, to represent those, um, that cause. Um, and so I thought that was kind of an interesting, you know, combination on one end, kind of the mystery of the migration, but then also kind of the, the representation of the monarch as kind of like our, I, I love what Aaron said about like the poster child, you know, mm -hmm. the monarch is, is migrates and, and doesn't really have any predators because the monarch has, you know, is kind of, is a toxic butterfly that eats milkweed, and you know nobody nobody can stand in its way. It's uh, unbelievable. Um, and of course, there's the the third aspect, which is that the monarch is obviously endangered. You know, um, for for many reasons, for you know, for pesticides, for you know, climate, you know, human induced climate change, deforestation, and so that is something that's also interesting. It, it's there's all, kind of all of these 
paradoxes around the monarch because when it when we speak about endangered species, we don't often speak about the monarch butterfly. You know, we speak about other other animals and and you know, and so the monarch is kind of everybody loves butterflies, but then you know, when we're speaking about endangered species, it doesn't get as much attention as maybe other animals. And 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 so I thought that was something that I wanted to shed light on also is 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 how this migration is is in peril, basically. Um, and so, you know, as, as a filmmaker and, and a scientist, I, I just went out and started investigating and asking scientists and, um, and activists and people back in Mexico where the butterflies arrive in the, in the butterfly sanctuary, just interviewing them and just kind of getting a sense of all of these topics and then trying to bring them together into, into this story. It occurs to me that uh, it's not just, um, you know, the, the, the monarch is a symbol of kind of borderless migrations and, and, and then the people that you have represented in the film, you know, are running up against the wall, right? That, that comes up in your, in your film uh, several, several times. Um, but that science is also borderless. And, but the science is also uh, you know, running into these other obstacles as well. I know, um, Aaron, I don't know if you can tell us a little bit about the field work that you were doing in, in Peru and, and how that might be changing and evolving. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, being able to go out and work in the Amazon rainforest has been one of the highlights of my life as a naturalist and biologist, just because it's, you know, the most diverse uh, place for, for different life forms on the planet. Um, you know, biodiversity is just second, second to nothing in that type of area. Um, you know, you'll, you'll take a, a flight out and then, you know, maybe you'll fly again into a small uh, jungle port city and then you'll travel by boat for many, many hours until you get to a, a remote field station where you can sort of hunker down. And, uh, you know, along the way, you'll see, you'll see charismatic megafauna like jaguars and, you know, macaws, um, beautiful animals. Um, but as an entomologist, someone who studies insects, that's really where it's, it's just incredible. Once you get off the boat, start walking around, um, you'll just see, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different species out there. Um, and so that, that is, um, you know, a, a, really, a really cool place to sort of observe this type of natural history and biodiversity. But at the same time, it's also impossible to overlook the changing landscape from human uh, mm -hmm. impacts. Um, and, uh, you know, similar sets of challenges to, you know, um, areas where the, the character grew up of uh, mining and resource extraction and how this changes the environment. Um, then it puts, puts, you know, organisms at risk, it deforests, but, you know, it's also, it, it, it's also a, a, a difficult challenge because humans need to support their families. And if they're, you know, mm -hmm. people who are endemic to the region, you, uh, you have these clashes between, you know, the natural world and, you know, humans um, extracting from it. Um, so I've seen both and, but watching the film, you know, it made me think about that too, about, you know, some of the characters who stayed behind and lived in this, this mm -hmm. uh, area where they experienced that firsthand um, and, and how that can affect their lives. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the megafauna, you know, the, the polar bears, the elephants, the, the, you know, the, the people use those as campaigns for donations, but people aren't thinking about the flies as much. And yet, the insects are arguably more important to our ecosystem. Absolutely, yeah. As as Alexis nicely said, you know, um, uh, it, it can be easy to put put those types of big critters that are fuzzy, they're mammals, they're you know, um, relatable, uh, maybe quickly relatable if it's a large polar bear or something cuddly and cute that you can sort of make that emotional case that we should save this animal and and we should care about it. Um, but as you touched on, Andres, that's really important to try and think too about these small yet diverse creatures, the tiny yet mighty, because mm -hmm. those are the ones that are, um, you know, fundamental to the ecosystem. They are the things that will pollinate our flowers, produce our fruit and our seeds. They'll serve as the food to lizards and birds and fish that will, you know, move up the, the trophic level in the food chain. So they're, they're critical, they're, they're critical. And, and yet um, we know through um, lots of current research and ongoing research that their populations are declining. Uh, it's not just the monarch butterfly, it's pretty much all butterfly populations are declining, as Alexis mentioned, due to many factors like uh, human-induced climate change and large landscapes that are cleared away and used for farming and heavy pesticide use. Um, and it's you know, dramatically affecting the monarch. And as far as insects go, that is, is probably one of the best ones that people are starting to become more aware of. 
And, you know, some people like to refer to these as umbrella species because, mm -hmm. you know, you can maybe raise up the monarch and, it, and if you mm -hmm. conserve areas um, using a species as, as that poster child, then you can sort of, you know, use that as a motivating force to get people to care more and, and think more deeply about preserving these areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking, what, oh, yeah. go ahead, I'll, go ahead. No, what, what's also fascinating about the monarch is that it, it involves a cooperation between countries, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it's not a single, you know, so like from, you know, from Ontario, you know, from, from the birth of these uh, monarch butterflies to obviously their migration and the milkweed and, you know, and the use of pesticides and of course, you know, Monsanto and all the horrible things they're doing, all these things are really affecting. And of course, the, the arrival into these forests and, you know, um, you know, preserving the, the forests, all of these things are related to the mining industry and all that is, is definitely affecting them. So I think it's interesting that everybody wants to, um, everybody loves butterflies and it wants to sort of appropriate them, you know, like I love monarch butterflies or they exist in my, in my area, but nobody wants to take responsibility mm -hmm. as well. Um, and it's always the fault of, of someone else, you know, and it's always, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I think it's a really interesting example of kind of how, you know, you know, without sounding too like new age here, how like everybody needs to cooperate um, to make this, you know, to kind of tackle these issues and, mm -hmm. and help preserve the monarch, yeah. We're all involved, but there was a village in your film that's, that has a direct relationship to the monarch. Uh, can you talk about how, you know, and in, in Aaron had referred to some of the, the real on the ground pressures that people have to make a living. Can you describe a little bit, uh, not just your work in the community making the film, but then this, this uh, community specific relationship to the monarch? Yeah, um, do we, maybe we can show the video because actually I, I did this video where I went to Angangeo and, and also interviewed some scientists and kind of like a collage of all of these. I think it's like a minute long. Um, and it's, it was actually a trailer for a series that I was making, um, kind of a prequel to the feature film called When Butterflies Speak. And I, I was speaking to scientists, you know, locals in, in Mexico. Um, I was also speaking to activists and I kind of created this series also to kind of create awareness about, about how the butterfly was connected to all these topics, but also as a way of raising interest for the, for the film. Um, and actually I, I do that quite a bit in my work is before making a feature film, I make these short films as a way of kind of, um, you know, even even in the funding process of trying to get people interested in the film, I, I do these short clips. So yeah, if, if we can show that and um, I can share a little bit about my time there. embryo right just patterns over and over again right you have repeating patterns you have bifurcations you can have spirals significan para nuestros abuelos nuestros padres y las generaciones actuales las almas de nuestros muertos visitándonos o llegando justo en el día de muertos a nuestra región abuelas muchos viajan de un lugar a otro y son naranjas no más we are interrogating nature we are not harnessing it. Should we make new butterfly wing patterns? I don't know. For, for answering important questions about the universe, yeah, but for, for fun, maybe not. How is it that a butterfly can know which direction to fly? Um, you know, that somehow, then this, and, and the migration is a multi-generational thing, right? It's not a butterfly that makes the whole trip. Vuelan sobre ríos, vuelan sobre montañas, eh, y por supuesto van a volar sobre cualquier pared que, que monten. The first thing you see is the butterfly. It has the four fists, footsteps on both wings, going up and then coming back down. Yeah, so some, some of those are some of the folks that we're talking about, like Ar Arno Marta and Nepan Patel. Um, but yeah, so we were talking about my, my time in Angangeo, which is 
um, which is one of these towns that is, you know, called the Pueblo Magico. It's a town that's basically at the foothills of some of the butterfly sanctuaries. And it used to be a mining town. You know, it, it, it basically most of its, of its like, you know, golden years were um, through the mining industry. And, um, and of course the mining industry has stopped there. Um, and, you know, now most of the, most of what the economy there is, is through butterfly tourism. It's people coming um, to visit butterflies. But what's complicated about that region, Michoacan is also, it's, you know, it's, it's a relatively dangerous area. There are some, you know, cartels and, and other, you know, things happening there. And so that also affects butterfly tourism. And so there's a big um, kind of, there's a, there's a big tension about people that want to reopen the mines and what that means to the, to the monarch butterflies and to the butterfly forest. And there was an article in the, in the New York Times, which was basically one million monarchs or one mine. You know, what do you, what do you choose? And so I, as I went there, I realized that I was a bit naive, you know, kind of this idealist, like, oh, you know, we need to protect the monarchs, we need to protect the, but I realized very soon that it's, it's a much more complicated issue because people are obviously out of work and, in the mining industry is important for them to survive. And it's not as, you know, as, as black and white as just me being this kind of, you know, whether I'm a biologist or a filmmaker and, and want to kind of, um, you know, talk about that. So I thought it would be interesting to have a character in the film that had an opposing view or a different perspective. And, you know, why not have a brother, you know, um, and have a brother that has stayed back in Mexico and kind of play with this kind of tension between brothers about one that left um, to study butterflies and then the other one that stayed and um, and stayed in this in, in his hometown but a lot of my work is going there and, and speaking to locals understanding also kind of the you know the, the situation politically but also environmentally there was a flood recently that happened in Angangueo that apparently was caused by the the mines filling up with water and then exploding um, and so they they kind of partly responsible for, for the kind of the minds that have been kind of staying there. And so all of these issues are, are brought into the script and embodied in different characters and, um, and embodied in, and also kind of translated into different lines that are, that are mentioned in the film. And of course, I thought it would be interesting that his uncle has like a butterfly hotel, you know, mm. and so, and that, you know, and there's mention of course of climate change and of, you know, he says, you know, this is a high season, but we're not seeing as many monarchs as we used to. And so all of these things are incorporated almost like hints. So people realize that, you know, there's, there's, there's issues about, um, about migration, about, you know, the mining industry and, um, and, you know, my, my job as a, as a storyteller and as a filmmaker is to take all of these facts and kind of bring them into kind of like a, a story. And so that's what I was, I was trying to do. Um... One of the interesting tensions between the brothers is that the one that stayed behind saved the life of the one who went off almost symbolically is that that, that work of working in the mine had to be done uh, for other people to have opportunities. So it wasn't as if that one was better than the other, but they had to coexist. Uh, I thought that was a, a remarkable uh, relationship that you, you created. Um, but I wanted you to also touch on uh, the, you know, the work that you did in the community to incorporate them as part of this film. So the filmmaking process itself wasn't entirely extractive. You were actually also involving them in the telling of their own story. Yeah, so I, I, both, in, in, both in kind of in New York, but also in, in Mexico, I love to involve, you know, um, the people that I'm working with in inside in the film you know and so whether you're a scientist or or the locals over there i i, I kind of bring them in as as kind of non-actors and, and work with them so many of the scenes in mexico a lot of the children that appear in the film a lot of the the um, you know there's a there's a scene where there's a an animal ritual that happens in michoacan these are all people that are locals that um that are participating in the film because i i, I strongly believe in participatory, um, you know, filmmaking and this idea that, you know, it gives them an opportunity to share their experience, again, as we were talking about before, through, through fiction, you know, kind of imagining 
a different version of themselves in a film and saying like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do a scene in a classroom or we're gonna re reenact the butterfly dance that you do every year, but we're gonna do it slightly differently or we're gonna have, you know, multiple cameras. It's gonna be, you know, you know there's gonna be some actors that are gonna be embedded in it. And so, um, so many of the scenes in Mexico were people that I had met through my documentary work um, that had that knew me because I had already come and kind of set the stage for what I was doing and then and then later on I would I would be like well do you want to have the role of like this little girl like the little girl Brisa who who plays kind of this like girl that he 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 likes when he's a child she was you know a girl that I met over there that um, when I saw her do the butterfly dance she had blue wings and I went up to her and I said why don't you have orange wings like everybody else and she's like oh I want to be different um, so I, and then, of course, as we we're talking about with Aaron, it, we're, the whole concept of the film is is color. Um, and she says, you know, everybody's always speaking about orange monarchs and this and that. And I wanted to have blue wings. And so I was like, okay, well then we'll we'll have you with blue wings in the film. Um, and so you know, all of these things really enriched my experience. And of course, I'm not from Mexico. I'm, I'm partly from Venezuela, but um, it also allows me to kind of. Um, you know, come as like somebody external and, and kind of tell these stories. Yeah. Great. I want to do a little bit of a time check and see how you guys were doing. I think we've been at this for a little over 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm, I'm, I could keep going. I don't know. I want to make sure that um, we were getting to everything that you guys want to talk about. Um, we, we can show, um, we can maybe show some of the images um, and, uh, and I can also maybe get Aaron's kind of thoughts on it, but, but some of the images of the filmmaking and the, I think I put a lot of the lab sequences as well, but um, I don't know if we can- Yeah, that sounds great. Scroll through them and, and kind of talk about those. And so this is, you know, part of the, you know, as Aaron does with, with his work, we, the idea when you're shooting a film is that we kind of recreate almost like tabletop uh, filmmaking, like kitchen filmmaking, where um, where there are many kind of techniques that are done in the lab that are you know that are kind of recreated for um, for the movie. So this is you know some of the traditional kind of pipetting, for example, which seems like something so mundane, but using a pipette. Um, and this is a moment where um, where I kind of stand in as kind of like a like the stand-in actor to do some of the of the molecular work. Um, but here we were, you know, using a pipette to kind of extract the pigment. And, and I have these sequences in the film that are almost like montage sequences um, that just show you the, you know, kind of the, the instruments that are being used in, in the lab. Um, and so, you know, this is a moment where I kind of get into a bit of the fiction world where the monarch, you know, obviously this is not accurate but you know this idea that if you put the monarch in some sort of solution you will start getting kind of the pigment that dissolves and and this is how he starts you know having the idea of kind of extracting extracting the pigment so here i'm kind of playing around with with fact and fiction in in some of these some of these moments this is the opening scene that we were talking about which is this is bob reed from from cornell university um, you know, I remember that the cinematographer was going crazy because the sequence was five minutes long and he's like, why are we, <laughs> why, why are we filming a pupa? Um, and, you know, it, it was fascinating because it's, you know, it's like high drama, you know, to, I remember Bob was like, I hope I, I need to do this. You know, he was like, I'm a bit rusty with my, <laughs> I don't know how you are, Aaron, in your, in your dissection. <laughs> I was gonna say it's it's it, it's funny to hear Bob did the dissection. I would have guessed it was you know maybe a, a graduate student or someone. You know that's typically how it goes. You have folks who are uh, the PIs or you know you, for better or worse they get stuck in their office writing the grants and then the students are usually at the lab bench. But I'm glad to hear that Bob has still got it. <laughs> yeah, Bob has it, and I remember I told Bob, uh, you know, I think I told him kind of like spontaneously, like, can you do a dissection? And he's like, oh. <laughs> like, I haven't done it in years and then he there was like a bit of like anxiety and then you know he sat down and looked like he put on the gloves he got really ready for the, for the moment and it was really really great um this is also you know something that's really important for me is to teach so this is Tenoch Huerta he's he's a Mexican actor that was in a few films like Sin Nombre and, and Narcos uh, um you know it's rumored that he's in the sequel of uh 
of Black Panther. Um, mm. So, but he, he, you know, there was, um, there is this importance of teaching actors how to, how to basically work in a lab. And I spent a few days with him to, you know, we, um, we had people from the Deplan lab, you, you know, Mike, right, Aaron? Mike as well from, uh, mm -hmm. from Deplan's lab. Um, yeah. But teaching how to do injections using the pipette. Um, and so this was really important for me to kind of get, get the actor comfortable with, with kind of the scientific setting. I would just say too, I really, I really love the, the, just the way that stage is set. It's like, you know, kind of messy. You've got your, you know, little notes stuck up on the wall. It's like very natural. You've got like the little butterfly cage hung to the left. So it's just, um, you know, cause that's, that's how it is. It's kind of gritty and very human and, and not like posh and, and uh, you know, all sterile. It's, it's just like, you know, you sit down and that's your work environment. Right, and, and for that, we had, you know, Arno was there, we had Bob, like, everybody was, 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 was contributing to the, to the bench, you know, mm -hmm. to making sure the bench looked like a bench, you know. Yeah, this was yeah. the first time I met Nepom in, in, at Berkeley in, I think it was in 2018. Um, you know, Nepom is, is amazing. And, um, and also, I had met him because he had, I run a film festival in New York, a science film festival, and he, had submitted this film about the squid. Um, I think Aaron, did you shoot that? Were you involved with uh, that? Uh, I, I was not, but I, I, I saw that film and, you know, it sort of, I think highlights the fact that Nipom is like, you know, uh, he, he's this like world renowned developmental biologist, but also has this passion for showcasing, you know, microscopy work in this very artful way through, through videography. And I, and I remember when meeting him and he mentioned you, Aaron, and, and he's, he said, you know, it's, it's so important for me to you know the importance of imaging, and he also was mentioning, "Oh, I'm working on a a project with a with a composer, and we're you know we're doing all these like compositions around the mm -hmm, developing mm -hmm. pupa." And I and so I was really inspired by um, by Nepom as, and then you know I think Nepom was one of the first butterfly scientists that I met because I think he told me, "Oh, you should speak to Bob, you should speak to Arno," and mm -hmm. and so that's how I started becoming kind of integrated into that you know um, developmental biology and. Um, you know, butterfly kind of family in there. So, um, yeah, so, so the, these are, you know, I, one of the scenes in the film is just a lab meeting, you know, they're speaking about their research and um, a lot of it is related to optics, which is, you know, one of these master regulators that when it's turned off, it, it has effects on in terms of color and, and borders. Um, and so, you know, we had like actual slides from some scientists that contributed and you know, and it was just interesting to kind of play those slides and, and have that scene where, you know, you're actually showing real data, but it's kind of incorporated into the film. And then, yeah, and then this is where, I think this is also your images, I think, Aaron, your, yours and, and Ryan's where I wanted him to touch the window and it kind of becomes, <laughs> you know, becomes like a, like a larval disc, it becomes like a butterfly wing that is developing. And so this is like my again, using your imagery to create, you know, probably the only moment that kind of enters into like a superhero context. Uh, this, this is a really cool scene. Uh, it was, it was just, I thought it was beautiful. Yeah. And I, and, and I, when I saw the, those images, I was like, oh, it would be interesting to kind of have that kind of like projected on a, on, on basically a, a window and, and play with, you know, almost like having the scientist being the conductor, being the one who actually you know, um, with his hand, he can actually um, create the time lapse in a way, and so that that was kind of the idea with it. Um, yeah, so these are some of the images in the butterfly sanctuary. You know, I, if anybody hasn't been there yet, um, it's just amazing. It's the you know some of those hibernation forests where the butterflies come after their long migration, and yeah, we got to shoot there, and it was actually one of the first times where we there was a fiction film shot there because a lot of the films that have been filmed there are, are Nat Geo and, and documentaries, but um, we had this actor kind of um, playing the young version of the scientist. And, you know, it's amazing working with kids and, and, and animals and insects because they, they do a lot of amazing improvisation around, around, the, around the butterflies. And I was, as I was mentioning, there's, you know, when the butterflies arrive over there, there's all kinds of rituals and dances and festivities where, kids dress up as monarchs. Um, the girls tend to be the monarchs. The boys sometimes are the trees or the caterpillars. 
Um, and it's just kind of an, an amazing performance and also, you know, them kind of receiving the monarchs then they arrive on the day of the dead. So the monarch butterflies represent the souls of the dead. And um, definitely this inspired many of the sequences in the film and, and the idea of turning into a butterfly as well. Yeah, and this was at the, at the, I don't know if you've been, Aaron, have you been to the, to the sanctuaries in Michoacan? Not yet, it is on my list. Oh, you have to go. <laughs> so it will happen. <laughs> you have to go. So this is in the Angangale Cemetery. They had, in, they had a gravestone in honor of butterflies that had died in a, in a storm, in, a, in basically like a, a snowstorm. Hmm. And they had it in three languages, in French, Spanish, and, and English, because of obviously the three nationalities of the monarchs. And basically, you know, um, you know, in remembrance of the millions of monarch butterflies that, um, that froze during the great storm of January, 2002. Um, and one of the stories of the film that was told to me by, by a guy was that some of the butterflies after being frozen, when the, you know, when, when the ice melted, some of the monarchs came back to life. And I thought that was just such an amazing story about the, you know, the resilience of the monarchs. And, and I had to include that as, as one of the voiceovers, you know. Mm -hmm. And they have offerings as well. They give, there's like honey and it's just an, an amazing scene that you have to see when you go there. Yeah, so those are, those are a few snapshots of, of that journey, but, um, but yeah, was I mean, a, I, you know, yeah. Sorry, I was just gonna ask too, Alexis, if that was part of, um, you know, what, one of the other scenes you have is where the, you know, you have these dead monarchs, but one of them starts twitching, you know, gently flapping its wings and then it progressively zooms in until it's like, you know, basically a universe inside one of the scales. Was that part of it too, the, you know, one of them kind of coming back? Right, so, so the idea was on one end, you know, in, in Mexico, they talk about the monarchs being the souls of the dead, right? Um, the souls of our ancestors. And then I, I was speaking to Arnaud at, in, at George Washington and, and he was mentioning that he had done a few dive-ins, you know, like going from macro butterfly into the, into kind of the, you know, electron microscope into kind of yeah. the, 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 these structures and so he said oh I've never done one for a monarch um, but basically he told me do you want to create one and, and I was like, of course for me as a filmmaker I, I feel you know frustrated that I left science at an at an early you know after my PhD so I was like <laughs> oh I'll, I'll love to be part of it and so we you know we spent a few days um, doing that and of course there was electron microscopy and then we stitched it all together mm -hmm. um, and it creates kind of like this you know the zoom in um, and you know we're gonna we're gonna add that that video later. But as we yeah. as we go more and more into the monarch butterfly, I have kind of the sounds of Mexico and and kind of this also like political messages coming through. And so I I created the soundscape that you know merges kind of the that zoom in and and it was actually part of an exhibition that I did um, in New York at um, at NYU where I was just you know speaking about how monarchs kind of the merge between science and, and, and all these other topics. And th that, that's one of those instances where I'm not only a filmmaker, but I get to dabble a little bit in the science and, and actually contribute to, you know, to kind of creating like a motor, motor butterfly zoom in. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing that we, yeah, they, yeah. and that appears in the credits. Yeah. It's super cool. I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing that's really fun is when you're working you know, so, sometimes science can be very driven by like, you know, a, a grant funding agency or very, you know, direct applications, or you have a direct question in mind that you sort of have to pursue a, 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 in your scientific endeavor. But then every now and then you get to just sort of do something for fun, let's say, like zoom in on right. the monarch scales. And sometimes that just hasn't been done before. And so, yeah. you know, sometimes it's fun to just bring something that no one's ever looked at. And then you get to look at a level of detail that just hasn't been observed before. So, you know, that level of detail that you get to zoom in on on the monarch scales, it was just really cool for me to see because I hadn't seen it, you know, in that level either. You've seen them fly around, but you get sort of, you know, all the way to the adult to zooming in, you know, orders of magnitude smaller and smaller and smaller. You see the individual scales and then you zoom in even more on a single scale. And then you can see, you know, the texture of one, the ridges, um, you know, little, um, little holes inside the scale that you zoom in on. So this is nanoscale, you know, you're zooming in on something that you can't observe with the naked eye. And so I think that's a really cool way to, you know, have that macro to micro to nano in, in a single shot with the transitions is really cool. 
Yeah, it, it was an amazing collaboration because, you know, when, you know, we, I had like animators and, and sound, you know, artists come in and it was just like a, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable to be able to kind of create that sequence. And I, um, yeah. And so to, to many more of those, and of course I, I never, I didn't know where to put that sequence in the film because mm -hmm. it's like four minutes and I didn't want to, you know, go too fast. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll just have it, you know, for, for people that watch the film, it appears in the credits and, um, and, yeah. and yeah, so. I like that. Yeah, at the, at the end, you. I think you went in the opposite direction. It zoomed out. Um, oh, so you I didn't zoomed see out. It. So, so I, I thought that was cool too. To, the way you end it, going in the opposite direction, because um, you don't quite know what you're looking at yet. Um, you know, just looks sort of like an alien planet uh, with exactly. just some sort of random textures. And then as you zoom out and out, you get the context of that it's part of this whole organism. Hopefully, we'll keep people to, to read the credits. <laughs> not, not, have them, not have them walk out of the of the <laughs> virtual or the physical cinemas. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'd love to hear from you both about is is where where is this going next? Uh, you know, mentioning this this explore, exploration. You mentioned uh, you know all the the, the different uh, breaking down boundaries. Um, Aaron, if you could talk to us a little bit about where your research is going and then Alexis about uh, the next film you're working on. So, so Aaron, if you could tell us a little bit about where your research is going. Yeah, well, I think it's an exciting time to be a scientist because you know this is, this is um, such an interesting time where we have these new technologies and new tools that enable us to learn more about life and evolution and natural history and um, you know, just, just the, just there are so many questions that are now more within reach. Um, and I think that's nicely touched on in the film too about, you know, it, you can be an individual just sitting at the lab bench by yourself, not like a massive team or anything and start to crack the code of life. And uh, I like that you had, um, you know, the, the professor sort of say like, you know, one down and 30,000 to go, you know, and if you, right. if you, you know, we're just getting started. I think that's, that's the main message. Um, that some of these technological advances um, are just getting us started to better understand life um, because there are, there are many more genes to go and there are many more organisms to investigate. Um, and so for those reasons, I think it's a really exciting time. Um, and uh, so, and, and at the same time, what, was, what we also talked about today is that um, there's never been more of a pressing time to address conservation and climate issues. Um, you know, if we don't act now um, and, and do things now, then we're going to lose um, a lot of our biodiversity on our planet, and that could have critical ramifications to our lives. And um, you know, uh, we're we're seeing we're seeing a lot of this now. But we we have to keep on going, and we have to act um, quickly. So I think these are these things sort of go hand in hand. Like you know, with science, we have these interesting questions and new ways to address them. But as you know, because we're studying biology, because we're studying life, and because we're losing it at a faster rate than ever before due to human activity. Um, we have to have this interplay where we're, you know, really making sure that we, we do things right and that we communicate this effectively to broader audiences, not just other scientists. So I think the, to me, those are sort of the two parallels of conservation and, and being more, um, you know, getting the, the public and, and policies in place to help us um, while we try and investigate, you know, life with, with our new tools at hand. Thank you. Now, Alexis, what's, what's next for you? Um, well, first, yeah, the, the film is, is just taking flight, you know, within the last few months. Um, you know, we're very excited to be showing it um, at Banff and, and at UC Berkeley. And so I'm um, very excited to show it, you know, to both scientists and non-scientists and, and see how the film also resonates with, you know, the, like the, the Latinx community and, and, and just kind of, you know, enriching kind of portrayals that, that we see in film. But, I'm, I'm working right now on a, I'm, I'm also interested in, in conservation and, um, and I've been particularly focused right now on, a, on indigenous rights. Um, and I have a film right now that I'm working on, which is about, um, based on the true story about an indigenous activist, her name is Elena Gualinga, who is in the, she, she lives in the Sarayaku community in Ecuador. Um, and it's basically the story of, a, of a, an indigenous woman that um, is trying to resurrect a jaguar that has passed away in the Amazon. And the jaguar is also the shaman um, in, in some of these communities. And so she seeks out a scientist that helps her bring him back through, uh, through the extinction. Um, the extinction is this very strange and compelling field where 
some scientists are making a case for bringing back animals from from extinction using also CRISPR and other techniques. The, the passenger pigeon and the woolly mammoth has been in the news. Um, but anyway, so it's a mixture of indigenous rights and and um, and the importance of you know conserving these communities that live in the forest and um, and what it means to bring back animals from from the dead. And so that will be shot between Ecuador and um, and New York. And it's also about like climate activism and you know and and all those things. So I'm in the midst of writing right now, and um, the film is called The Next Jaguar. And um, and hopefully next year we'll 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 be able to start filming in the in the rainforest, which will be <laughs> a totally amazing experience <laughs> making a movie out there. And I know Aaron has spent some time in Peru, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll convince you to come, uh, Aaron, as a as like a second camera and help me kind of capture the, the biodiversity there. So anytime, anytime, Alexis, you let me know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, but I'm not joking. I definitely will reach out. About that, so. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. This has been really enlightening, really excited to see the next work and where the science is going. Really fascinating to see how both science and art can, can come together and help us uh, think of these pressing issues in new, new ways. So thank you very much to both of you and, and to Banfo. Thank you.